Hello, welcome and good afternoon. I see some questions about sound not working, but I think we are good. Um, welcome to session 1.2a of the Salish Sea Ecosystem Conference, all virtual this year. This topic is trophic energy flow in the Salish Sea. And this is part four um, of focusing on marine mammals. My name is Scott Beers and I'll be chairing this session, though it may not look like it at the moment. I am based in Seattle. I'm currently the chair of the Marine Mammal Work Group within the Puget Sound Ecosystem Monitoring Program, also known as PSEMP. And I also coordinate the Orca Sound Hydrophone Network. And I'm wearing my shirt today to ask you as you shelter during the COVID-19 era, um, I encourage you to visit orcasound.net and learn to listen for whales. I'd like to acknowledge and identify the amazing Western Washington University Conference support staff who made this virtual opportunity even possible. Um, we're being assisted today by the talented Caleb Klein and um, he'll be helping answer your questions through the Q&A tool. Um, before we get started, I'd like to thank the leaders of other PSAMP work groups who proposed this four session theme on trophic energy flow. Last summer, Todd Sandell, Jamie Selleck, and Anna Cagley had the idea of four sessions on trophic energy flow from plankton to apex predators, arranged sequentially so that all speakers could attend all talks. As an oceanographer turned marine biologist, I was really looking forward to the rare opportunity to consider in one fell swoop through the ecosystem who is eating whom with within the Salish Sea. So this session on marine mammals was meant to be part four, preceded by phytoplankton and zooplankton, then forage fish, and then marine birds. But like the Star Wars episode number four, this is just the beginning. I do have a new hope that there will be sequels in the coming months, and perhaps also during Salish Sea Ecosystem Conference 2022. Um, I think Caleb may share in the chat a link to the other presentations that are part of the digital program for this virtual conference. And um, you'll see there that there are a growing number of presentations on the other parts of the, of the food web. So with no further ado, I'd like to um, introduce our, our panelists. I'm very proud of the breadth of knowledge across many Salish Sea species that the speakers will present today. Thank you to all of you speakers for finding the time and energy um, during this era to present your science. My one regret about today's session is that I was unable to recruit more speakers from Canada. I wanna emphasize that um, many complimentary insights have come from Canada. They just aren't represented here today very well. Although uh, Aaron's partner, Rob Williams, is, will I think speak through her a little bit and give us his Canadian perspective. Um, with an eye to better transboundary balance in the future, I would like to invite Canadians and First Nations scientists involved in marine monitoring mammals to join the Marine Mammal Work Group. So I do believe that the recovery of Puget Sound in the Salish Sea will be most effective if it's guided by accurate understanding of trophic energy flow in the Salish Sea. As you can see from this diagram, which came from Canada, generated by Preakshot and Perry for the Strait of Georgia ecosystem model, Trophic interactions around here are complex. Plus, they surely have evolved over time and vary geographically. So without further ado, let's dive into understanding those interactions today and all try to get a little wiser. Our first speaker is John Kalambakitis from Cascadia Research. And John is going to share his screen to help you learn a little bit more about baleen whales. Okay, and if uh, you can see my screen okay and uh, hear me okay, I'll begin. So my goal was to do an overview, particularly of two of the more common baleen whales that we have in the Salish Sea, humpback and gray whales, and talk a little bit about their feeding behavior and especially some of the new results that we have uh, on their feeding in the Salish Sea. And uh, because there have been some dramatic changes that have occurred 
for both humpback and gray whales, we've been conducting studies on them for quite some time. Uh, humpback whales, um, Cascadia has been studying since the mid 1980s, but primarily focused along the US West Coast in California. And uh, it's been exciting in the last five years uh, to have a bit more of a focus in the Salish Sea and where we're based uh, here in Puget Sound. Uh, <clears throat> but our work goes back to the mid 1980s. Uh, we've used these fluke identification photographs to track trends in abundance uh, and movements of humpback whales. We have over 50,000 of these uh, documented records of at least 5,000 individual humpback whales along the West Coast uh, that we've been studying. And similarly for gray whales, we've studied them with photo ID using markings on the side. Uh, though there our focus has been what's called the Pacific Coast feeding group of gray whales, which I'll explain a little bit more about uh, the whales that spend uh, their spring, summer, or fall feeding here, and also a unique group called the sounders. Uh, overall, uh, we've documented trends in humpback whales along the West Coast that have showed a dramatic increase. Uh, and we've divided our abundance estimates between a, a feeding group that feeds off California, Oregon, and then one that we treat for Washington, Southern DC. And this figure is just showing the overall trend for Washington, Southern DC. And it's gone from the mid 90s estimates of only a few hundred animals now up to closer to a thousand animals. These three different lines on this graph show three different mark recapture models. Uh, the higher one being one that tries to adjust for some of the bias due to heterogeneity and capture probabilities of animals. But all of them show the same upward, fairly dramatic trend in humpback whale occurrence uh, and abundance estimates. Again, this is for all of Washington, Southern British Columbia. And along with these increasing trends on the West Coast have come increasing occurrence of humpback whales in a variety of areas where they used to be less common at least 20, 30 years ago. And most relevant, what I'll focus on is at the top of this map on the right is the Salish Sea, but there have been other areas where we've seen kind of changes in uh, occurrence of humpback whales in some protected and inside waters, again, not along their common range, which has typically been more concentrated along uh, the continental shelf edge, uh, where some of the krill abundance and productivity is highest. Uh, this is just taking some sighting data to Cascadia and uh, Whale Museum and Orca Network and showing that the reports of humpback whales inside the Salish Sea uh, underwent a pretty dramatic increase in the late 2000s and then continued to increase after that. I haven't shown later years because as a species becomes more common, sometimes there's a little bit of an effect. Uh, these kind of plots of sightings, reports from the public, you know, both reflect where the public tends to see them, but also reflects whether they're novel or new uh, and likely to generate a sighting report or not. Uh, so the rate of this increase may not be accurate, but uh, it does capture that it was in the late 2000s that we saw this beginning of an increase in humpback whale occurrence. Now, initially, I just want to show you a little bit about some of the results of the surveys that uh, we did in 2018, where we had a higher level of effort. These little white lines you see here are where we took our rigid hull inflatable, did surveys with a uh, support and funding both through a joint program we're doing with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife supported by NOAA, but also part of a, a wider West Coast wide survey NOAA was doing uh, where they supported doing the small boat photo ID work that we did. And so those faint lines show our small boat effort. The squares show where we sighted humpback whales just in 2018. And you'll see the, you know, there are familiar areas off the Washington coast where we were seeing humpback whales, especially in the Juan de Fuca Canyon uh, areas like Swiftsure Bank. But also you'll see this a concentration of sightings inside the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And I'll just zoom in on that a little bit more. And here you'll see, uh, you know, some of the concentrations of sightings that we had in, in a number of areas. And some of these numbers were substantial in that area off CQ right in the middle of this map. Uh, this area right in here. Uh, we estimated about 200 humpback whales were feeding in that area in, in mid-summer of 2018. So some fairly substantial numbers uh, of animals that were present in those areas. 
Now, as a part of our work doing both photo ID, we also deployed some of these types of archival tags, tags that we put on whales that uh, then we would have to recover and could take different levels of data. In the top right, you see a, uh, a multi-sensor video tag that we would attach with suction cups uh, and would give us anywhere from a few hours to a day of data. And the lower right is uh, a TDR10 tag that we would attach with short darts uh, that could give us longer periods. And we've been deploying these tags on a variety of baleen whale species along the West Coast. But for the first time in 2018, we deployed these on some of these humpback whales inside of the Salish Sea. So that was our first effort using these tags in, in that approach. And they would give us a wide variety of data. This is, uh, you know, the summarized data from one deployment of one of the CATS tags. It just shows a snapshot of some of the video we were getting uh, <clears throat> that would record for several hours. Uh, there are 12 different sensors that the tag records and you can get information on not only dive depth, uh, but the accelerometry signal can tell us when whales are feeding, when they've opened their mouths that create these rapid decelerations. Uh, and we can track their movements with GPS data. Uh, and I think, uh, and then uh, we would also be getting data with our dual frequency uh, depth sounder. And this just shows a, a snapshot that actually catches some tracings of whales diving down. And the lower panel actually shows uh, a profile that shows the bottom as that thick black line, but then along the bottom is a dense krill layer that the whales were feeding on down uh, about 150 meters deep uh, in that case. So that big concentration of whales were feeding primarily on krill. And humpback whales, this is something we found with humpback whales along the west coast, they're capable of feeding both on krill, which often is concentrated near the shelf edge and a little bit deeper waters. And then at other times they're uh, able to feed on uh, small schooling fish and bait fish, uh, anchovies, herring, and that also occurs inside the Salish Sea. This larger concentration was krill feeding animals. Uh, those smaller bait fish concentrations are sometimes concentrated around banks and more shallow water areas, and that can attract some of these humpbacks to feed. And we found some significant patterns, primarily in our work on the West Coast, where humpback whales vary from year to year, whether they're targeting fish or krill predominantly, and that fluctuates with the relative abundance of those types of prey. Uh, so we do see some variation in that. The tracks, the longer tracks we got from our dart attached tags showed the movements of these whales. And this was particularly insightful. This is a blow up of a track uh, of a humpback whale and the lower panel shows its dive record across a 24 hour period uh, starting kind of midday of the first day. And you'll see that dramatic shift from deeper dives into very shallow uh, dives at night and then transitioning back to feeding dives down deeper in, in the following day. And what that highlights is both the higher vulnerability of humpback whales and other baleen whales. This is something we've documented more widely with our research to things like ship strikes at night because they're spending often twice as much time near the surface in the zone where they could be impacted by ship strikes and sometimes that's also relevant to anything like gill nets that might be primarily in the in the upper level of the water column so that higher vulnerability you'll also see from the movements that these animals were heavily feeding in the central part of the strait of Juan de Fuca right in in and amongst uh, the shipping lanes and we actually have to avoid the shipping lanes in some of our work for that now transitioning to talk a little bit about humpback whales, I mean gray whales, uh, just a very brief introduction that the majority of the gray whale population, what's called the Eastern North Pacific gray whale population migrates from breeding areas in uh, Baja at the lower right of this panel up to feeding areas up in the Bering Sea shown in the top part of this panel up here in red. Uh, but this whole area highlighted in green along the coast is the area used by what's called the Pacific Coast Feeding Group of gray whales, a group of a couple of hundred humpback uh, gray whales that feed through the spring, summer, and fall don't appear to make that northern migration uh, and are often feeding on different prey. Uh, and that's been kind of an important discovery pioneered originally by Jim Darling and some of his work uh, along the coast of Vancouver Island. <clears throat> 
I'm also going to talk specifically about a group of about a dozen gray whales that come into the Salish Sea because that's relevant to our focus on the Salish Sea. And these animals feed in this North Puget Sound area around Whidbey Island. Uh, and even though it's a small number of whales, I'll show you uh, Salish Sea plays an important role in both their health and condition. Uh, and they feed on, in, on prey in some unique ways. Uh, this has become particularly important this year because this is the annual mortality documented strandings of gray whales by year in Washington state. And you'll see it varies widely by year, but you'll see this dramatic peak in 1999-2000. This is what was called an unusual mortality event. And then you'll see the dramatic peak in 2019 that actually exceeded those estimates. Uh, we had 34 uh, dead gray whales that washed up and were documented in Washington state in 2019, a record number. And keep in mind that the documented strandings of gray whales uh, represents potentially as little as 10 or 20 percent of the true number dying. Uh, and this higher mortality rate, both in, the, uh, in 2019, uh, occurred along the entire range of gray whales. So there were additional mortalities in Mexico, California, British Columbia, and Alaska, uh, you know, that, you know, topped over 200 different animals, uh, again, in that dramatic underestimate. The Sounders gray whales, uh, what has surprised us about them, we first documented them in 1990 using the Salish Sea in Northern Puget Sound. Uh, they're very distinctly marked animals we can track. Uh, and it's been that these same whales return every year. Uh, and so we're seeing some of the same individuals year after year. And they feed much like many gray whales, primarily are benthic feeders. They feed on the bottom. And what's unique about the sounders is they're actually feeding in the intertidal zone. And they'll filter out a slurry of mud and sediment off the bottom and filter out the ghost shrimp and other small organisms. Mm -hmm. This aerial shot here actually shows uh, these depressions at low tide that were feeding pits that are about six feet long by three feet wide created by feeding gray whales. Uh, and areas like the Snohomish River Delta, this is actually a Google Earth image off Everett, and this represents actually thousands of little dots that represented gray whale feeding pits. And you can see gray whales fed extensively in the Snohomish River Delta and along the shoreline, and, and they do this in a number of areas, you know, Possession Sound, Port Gardner, Port Susan, and Saratoga Passage. Uh, I mentioned the return of animals every year. Uh, this is something that we uh, is summarized in this slide for over 30 years, the first half dozen animals. And columns here are years, rows are different individuals. And these top two rows here are the first two individuals we documented. These green boxes indicate we documented that individual that year feeding in Northern Puget Sound. And you'll see some of these individuals have been seen consistently from when they're initially seen almost every year uh, since then. Interestingly, most of them have been documented as males, which we show in this column here. And the few females we have occasion we have not seen with calves, but they have occasional years they don't show up that may well be years that they have a calf. Uh, what's unique about these gray whales is the tags reveal that they were feeding primarily at high tide when they could access those dense ghost shrimp beds that only had water over the top of them uh, at high tide. So uh, the, these, blue bar, these blue bars here you see represent when gray whales were feeding and they were feeding just a couple of meters deep. Uh, you see the tidal cycle superimposed here on this and you'll see the gray whales who were only feeding on the rising and high tide. So they had these short windows that they could uh, feed on these dense ghost shrimp beds. Uh, what's new this year is we've been able to actually document some of the gain that they've had from feeding on these ghost shrimp. And this is a partnership with John Durbin and Holly Fernbaugh of SR3 and SEA. So in conjunction with our photo ID work, we've been getting drone-based images uh, of the health condition and body condition of these whales. Uh, and that's been a new element. You're at 14 minutes, John. Thank you. And, uh, and those images have shown us, shown these whales, even in periods of a few weeks. This is three images of the same whale, just two and one week apart. And you can see it noticeably has gained girth. 
just in that short period. So these whales are getting an enormous gain. Uh, other whales we've seen that are new to the area did not show that gain. We're also measuring this with some of our side photographs that uh, go back more 30 years so we can look at how body condition has changed. Okay, I think I'm just going to jump to my conclusion slide because I'm nearing the end of my time and just make, you know, the key concluding points that, uh, you know, humpback whales have returned in large numbers to the Salish Sea. It is a major factor in kind of changing uh, you know, kind of the upper level predators in the Salish Sea environment uh, that we're just getting a handle on, looking at their prey and how many are using it. Uh, these gray whales have made this discovery of this feeding area, and it is an incredibly important feeding area for those dozen whales that use it. And I just wanted to highlight some of these tools are giving us really new insights into how to document their feeding and what they're gaining from it. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, John. Um, I wanted to point out to you that there's some great questions. I tried to answer one of them, so make sure you uh, check the answered tab to, as well. Um, and I think there's even a question from Eileen in the uh, in the in the panelist chat. Uh, the next speaker is Erin Ash, who I think is going to share her screen as well. Is that right, Erin? Uh, make, make sure you unmute as well. I can do that, I think. All right. Just go back to the beginning. <laughs> um, there you go. And folks who um, haven't seen my message in chat, just so everyone knows, we're using the Q&A tool within Zoom. So feel free to ask your questions there. We've got lots of, about 700 participants, so we're not going to be taking um, verbal questions from the audience today. Great. Well, thank you very much, Scott, and thank you, John, for that fascinating talk. Um, I'm really thrilled to join everyone virtually today, and thank you to all the organizers and sponsors for switching to an online format so we can have this discussion. Um, as Scott said, my name is Erin Ash. I'm a scientist at Oceans Initiative, a research nonprofit with bases in British Columbia and Washington State. And today, um, I'm going to share with you some of the work we've been carrying out on Pacific white-sided dolphins and herring in British Columbia to understand more deeply the responses of a top predator to um, fluctuating prey and disturbance. And um, my primary aim today is to share some of the work I'm doing so you're aware of the study and to prompt discussions about potential lines of research and future collaborations, really. Um, so it's, the talk is sort of a hybrid of um, presenting preliminary results and proposing um, future lines of research. So I look forward to feedback, whether it's in the chat or through email following the presentation. <clears throat> and... I'd like to begin with some acknowledgements and thank yous to my collaborators, um, Rob Williams, Leslie New, and Brandon Southall for collaboration on the prey demography and disturbance part of the study, and to Tessa, Francis, and Alec McCall, who gave me a great crash course on <laughs> herring and herring dynamics um, and for incubating some ideas on the topic. Um, so many of us are keenly aware of the critical role Pacific herring play in the food webs of the Salish Sea. Herring support seabirds, fish, marine mammals, and are vital to our healthy ecosystem. But we all know that um, many of these stocks are in trouble. Some BC herring stocks have collapsed and failed to recover, even in the absence of fisheries. Um, this reminds us that fishing pressure is not the only factor to consider. Our ability to manage herring fisheries sustainably relies on better information on bottom-up and top-down forces affecting herring mortality, recruitment, and productivity. And when we consider top-down forces, um, understanding these predator-prey relationships is really necessary to advance our understanding of the effects of fisheries on marine ecosystems. As we all know, ecosystems are complex and we often rely on, have to rely on proxy measurements to interpret their 
their status, but interpretation is difficult when a large number of variables are included. Um, my daughter is here crying. <laughs> um, so we have limited. Um, um, sorry about that. Um, so it can be helpful to generate an index or indices um, to show trends or variability so that we can simplify this situation without ignoring the complexity. So this may give us information that is usable for management action. Um, I'm going to move on. Um, this, so one of the predator-prey relationships um, is between Pacific white-sided dolphins and herring. So to set the context, in British Columbia, there are an estimated 26,000 dolphins, with a few hundred of those thought to occur in the heart of the Salish Sea. And we know that they eat herring. Um, so this video is a little moment of zen, and maybe <laughs> my daughter can catch her breath. Um, this underwater footage was collected in Johnstone Strait off the Adam River while we were carrying out a study on the population consequences of disturbance in oceanic dolphins. Um, I've been studying these dolphins for a decade, <laughs> um, and I'm convinced that the relationship between herring and dolphins may be as informative as a better known relationship between Chinook salmon and southern resident killer whales. It's just that we can't count every dolphin, so every aspect of the study is about taking very small statistical samples um, from very large numbers of predators and prey, and it can be hard to see signals in some of these dynamic ecosystems. So here we just have a bait ball of small schooling fish that the um, dolphins were exploiting. Um, so white-sided dolphins um, have potential as a food web indicator. Um, they've been using the inshore waters for decades, but a key study by Alexander Morton back in 2000 showed us that white-sided dolphin distribution tracks did decadal scale changes in forage fish and species composition, um, information from scale samples, and stomach content analysis by Alexander Morton and Kathy Heisey um, showed that herring comp comprise about 60% of dolphins diet, and captive studies um, by Aaron Rex Steiner show that an individual dolphin could eat 12 to 16 kilograms of herring a day. So the maybe a candidate for, um, a suitable candidate for dependent predator status. They exceed 20% of the diet for dolphins, um, which is a threshold used to define this um, herring dependent predator status in many ecosystem studies. So our long running uh, photo identification study is exploring links between herring abundance and dolphin demography. And we carry this work out in an accessible part of the range, Johnstone Strait in the Broughton Archipelago, which is one inlet over <laughs> from the um, Northern Sailor Sea boundary near Butte Inlet. Um, and the photo identification studies show matches between individuals photographed in the Broughton all the way down to the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Um, and these photos occur only months apart in some cases. And we, in the Broughton Archipelago, there are resident herring stocks. Um, and so drawing from more than 25 years of photo identification data, we used an open population capture recapture model with time series of abundance of herring and pink salmon entering the model as candidate covariates from 1990 to 2016 to estimate uh, apparent survival of non-calf dolphins. And here the graph shows um, See if I can, yeah, here we go. <laughs> um, the estimated relationship between Pacific white sided dolphins and apparent survival, um, sorry, dolphin apparent survival and herring spawn, spawning biomass um, over here. And I'm using the term apparent survival because this is an open population capture or capture model where mortality is confounded with temporary immigration. Um, so we know from previous analyses that there's some degree of movement in and out of the study area. So I plan to continue this work with more sophisticated models that take that into account.
Um, but you can kind of think of the y-axis here as telling us something about both the degree to which dolphins use the area and the degree to which they survive. And this is a stepwise model between hearing and apparent survival. Um, and it makes me wonder whether there's a hearing abundance threshold um, below which dolphins may abandon the habitat or migrate out of the habitat or don't survive altogether, which may um, have some implications in the long term for their population viability. So using this empirical relationship, uh, we can make a prediction about between hearing abundance and apparent survival. In this graph, um, apparent survival, dolphins is on the y-axis, um, and herring biomass is found on the x-axis. And dolphin survival is highest in abundant herring years, which is um, maybe not completely unexpected. So uh, originally this part of my work was motivated by trying to predict the population consequences of noise and disturbance for oceanic dolphins. Um, that required deriving a relationship between prey and dolphin demography so we could predict what would happen if noise disrupted feeding behavior. But conceptually, you could use um, the same approach to explore what would happen if fisheries removed some fraction of herring from the dolphin's habitat, just as um, modeling with noise and, and disturbance. Um, so as we expand the study, we propose to assess the role of white-sided dolphins from two perspectives. The first, is we want to evaluate the effect of herring biomass on dolphins by essentially reverse engineering quantitative management targets um, from the currently qualitative targets that are being used. We've done this similar exercise um, we published a few years ago with southern resident killer whales. Um, and then we can apply this prey demography link to identify the level of depletion of herring that would result in population level consequences that exceed safe harm levels, so in the PBR framework. Um, and we could do this with this study, um, in this study area where we have localized resident herring and in Georgia Strait where we have mixed stocks. Um, second, we could look at it from the other way around, from how, what impact the dolphins are having on herring. And here we could include white-sided dolphins in George Strait um, and, the herring, and the herring biomass assessments from that, that area, both in the presence of, and absence of fishing pressure. Um, and I've proposed using something like uh, MICE models, the models of intermediate complexity for ecosystem assessments, to explore these interannual trends in herring abundance with and without fishing pressure. Um, and see how these affect the population dynamics of white-sided dolphins. And this would allow us to evaluate their role as a food, an effective food web indicator. Um, then we could also model impacts of uh, marine mammal predation more broadly on these localized herring stocklets, as uh, Tessa Francis likes to call them, um, by conducting simple bioenergetics models. So with um, the white-sided dolphin project, the data are long-term, but, but quite sparse because there are many of them. Not everyone is identifiable. Um, and dolphins and herring are both volatile. Uh, so we need large sample sizes. Um, I'm engaged in analysis right now with additional dolphin data and models to account for some of the temporary immigration and to raise our, our capture probability. Um, White-sided dolphins are not listed, of course, under SARA or ESA, so they're a little bit low on the priority list for funding, but they may be a high priority for potential use as an ecosystem indicator in herring fisheries management. So we're seeking collaborations um, to expand the study and perhaps form a technical workshop, virtual maybe or otherwise, hopefully, <laughs> to assess candidate analysis, a candidate analysis framework, maybe applying the uh, the mice models in this case. Um, and sustainable herring fisheries, you know, will require deeper understanding to sustain the integrity of these predator-prey relationships and marine food webs. Um, 
I think Southern resident killer whales, of course, have really exemplified this ethos, um, but with Chinook salmon, but Pacific white-sided dolphins and herring may be an, another important system to pay attention to. Um, it's a little bit below the surface and a little murkier, murkier in its <laughs> relationship, but definitely uh, worth having a look. Um, and that concludes my talk. Thank you very, everyone for your time and attention um, and for your patience while my daughter cried <laughs> during my presentation. <laughs> I'm sure many of us empathize with you, Erin. That was masterfully um, managed. <laughs> yeah. As a, I put a link to your marine bio camps, which uh, hopefully oh. all kids will be able to fully participate in <laughs> in the coming weeks. Thank you, um, Scott. You're welcome. Thank Great. you, Erin. And uh, next up, we have um, Katrina McAver from Marine uh, Mammal uh, Pacific Mar Mammal Research. Um, and she is going to give us some insights into harbor porpoises. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Scott. Um, so Scott's going to be sharing my screen. Um, hi, everybody. And yeah, welcome. My name is Katrina McKeever. I'm the research assistant here at Pacific Mammal Research. We are based in Anacortes, Washington. So we're up in the northern part of Washington state. And once again, just like to second, you know, many thanks to the conference organizers and to Scott for taking on this massive undertaking of the virtual conference. Um, but I'm really glad that everyone can be here today. It looks like we have a lot of participants. So let's get going. Like I said, today I'm going to talk to you about Harbor porpoises catching and handling large fish on the U.S. West Coast. This is actually um, one of our most recent publications in Aquatic Mammals, and that paper is open access. So feel free to go read up more on this if you would like. Um, so Scott, if you want to move on to the next slide. Okay, so globally, harbor porpoises are non-specialized feeders. So they consume invertebrates and fish species, but pretty much that falls within the 30 centimeter and below size range typically. So some of the common prey items that we know they consume here in the Salish Sea are things like Pacific herring, walleye pollock, Pacific hake, sandlands, northern anchovies, rockfish. Typically the smaller forage fish are the type of species we tend to think about porpoises consuming. One quick side note just to bear in mind, a lot of the diet studies that we have for harbor porpoises are using otoliths, which is the inner ear bone of the fish. So if for some reason the otolith breaks down really quickly in the porpoise's stomach or the head of a prey item is not consumed, it's possible that prey will get missed off those diet studies. So I just want to make that clear at the outset. The prey that we're, the prey studies that we're looking at from the past may not be representative of all the species that a harbor porpoise is consuming, but they are giving us a pretty good idea of the type of prey they consume in an area. Next slide. Can we move on? Oh, there we go, perfect. <laughs> um, however, we do know that large prey are being consumed by harbor porpoises. So for example, in Norway, um, a female harbor porpoise that was 138 centimeters, so a little less than a meter and a half, had a European eel that was 59 centimeters in her stomach. So that's almost half the size of the porpoise. So we know they are consuming larger prey items. However, this has never been documented on the West Coast before. And those diet studies that I mentioned, if you add all the, the data time up, it's about 30 years worth of data. And we don't really have any documentation of them consuming these large prey items. One really important thing to point out here is that information is extremely limited on wild harbor porpoises in general, and especially their foraging ecology and behavior. And so at Pacific Mammal Research, that's part of what we're doing. Um, we have a long-term photo ID study on harbor porpoises that we've been doing since 2014. Um, and part of that is to learn more about how these animals are utilizing and interacting with their environment and their prey. Next slide. Okay, so getting into the observations themselves, like I said, this is a description of our paper, which is an observational study. Um, both of these are from land-based behavioral sites. So the first is, you can see there on the right-hand side in northern Washington, that's where we are based at Pacific Mammal Research in Anacortes. Um, the second observations will be from our colleagues at the Marine Mammal Center down in San Francisco Bay. Their platform of opportunity is actually the Golden Gate Bridge. And then we'll also briefly discuss one stranding incident of a female harbor porpoise in the Cook Inlet, Alaska. Next slide. All right, so the observations in Anacortes were from Burroughs Bay, which is our primary study site. These were taken by our colleague, Sana Hessing from the Netherlands, and these are all her wonderful pictures. 
So the first two are from August of 2017. The third one is actually from July of 2019. So in all cases, the harbor porpoise was seen to be doing quite consistent behavior. So swimming rapidly in a circle in the same spot, diving frequently and re-emerging head first. Sauna witnessed the porpoise accelerating quickly and then the fish capture was actually seen just below the surface. So you can see from the pictures here, we have enough of the, of the porpoise um, and the fish here. You can see the porpoise is carrying the fish sideways, kind of just behind the gill area. And we were able to identify the fish as some species of salmonid. We can't identify it to species level. The pictures weren't quite that detailed, but we do know that it was some species of salmonid. Next slide. All right, the second observation from Burroughs Bay, just a few days later on the 12th of August, 2017. Again, fairly consistent behavior from the porpoise. Once again, the rapid swimming in a circle. This um, instance involved a lot more splashing. The fish got away a few times, the porpoise re-caught it, the fish was thrown in the air at one point, much more of a dramatic capture event. Um, again, we had enough visibility of the fish here to identify it as a species of salmonid. Um, and again, you can kind of see it's trying to catch the fish in that sideways orientation again. Next slide. All right, the last observation from Burroughs Bay here, uh, this is the one from July 2019. You can see in that top picture, we have a much clearer image of the fish itself. And this one we were able to identify as a coho salmon. So one of our common salmonid species for the Salish Sea area. Once again, you can see this kind of sideways orientation of the porpoise carrying the fish. Um, and again, a lot of splashing, swimming in a circle. Next slide. Okay, so moving on to the observations from San Francisco. Um, you can see the vi vision of the pictures is a little bit different. They're looking down on the porpoises where we're kind of looking at the porpoises. Um, so this one, you could actually see the fish chase a little bit clearer. In these instances, the fish was actually identified as American shad. So a little bit different than our um, Burroughs Bay sightings. Uh, that's actually an introduced species to the West Coast. It's native to the US East Coast. Um, so these observations were from 2017 and 2016. Very similar behavior from the porpoise to our Burroughs Bay observations, uh, swimming rapidly in the circle. You can see it turning to chase the fish there, and then again, carrying the fish in that sideways orientation. And Scott, if you just move it on and play the video here, we do have a brief little video clip of the, um, yeah, next slide, there you go. Uh, the porpoise carrying the fish after capture. Um, and you can see the size of the fish nicely here in comparison to the porpoise's head. Nice wide fish, got some interested porpoise following before it dives down and out of sight. And in all cases, the, um, we, we didn't ever see the fish consumed, so it's important to note that. So that's why I'm specifically referring to these as capture events. We didn't ever see the porpoise eat the fish. Okay, and you can move on to the next slide. The next instance is from the year before in October 2016. Again, the fish species was identified as American shad. And this time we know that it was actually a female harbor porpoise that caught the fish and she did have a calf with her. So I'll talk a little bit later about why it's important to note the sex of the animal uh, performing this behavior. But just in this case, we do know that it was a female. Um, and in all cases in Burroughs Bay and in San Francisco, all of these chase and capture events took about 30 seconds. So pretty rapid in, in um, timeline. Okay, next slide. Gory picture warning on this one, just so you know. <laughs> okay, so this one's a little bit different. Like I said, this is this um, stranding event. So our colleague Mark Weber was up in Alaska in 2014 and they got a call from the local fishery. Uh, Har Harbor porpoise had stranded in their gill nets and the fishery reported it. Mark was able to go to the necropsy and this was a confirmed female Harbor porpoise. She was lactating and she had multiple fish in her stomach. And you can see from the pictures here, she also regurgitated some fish back up into her throat and mouth. Now, further investigation of the species of prey was not conducted during the necropsy, but given that the local fishery there starts fishing for pink salmon in August, and because she was caught in their gill net, it's highly likely that she was eating pink salmon. Next slide. So in all these cases, you can see, and it was nice with that video, you can see how big the fish is in comparison to the porpoise's head. These are large fish species. Um, and even if the porpoises are consuming juveniles or subadults of these species, it's still much larger than the typical small forage fish that we think about their diet consisting of. So for example, American shad are, are averaged about 50 centimeters to 60 centimeters in length, can get up to five, five and a half kilograms in weight. They have dorsal spines, which I'll touch on a little bit later, but that's just important to note about that species. 
For the Salmonids, the five to six species that we commonly have here in the Salish Sea, depending on the species, ranging from 50 to 80 centimeters and weight of about 1.8 to up to 7.8 kilograms. So these are all much, much larger than that typical kind of sandlands or herring um, that we tend to think about porpoises consuming. Next slide. Um, also very important to note that these are both new prey species for the U.S. West Coast harbor porpoises. So American shad have never been previously reported as a prey species for harbor porpoise, either on the East Coast where it's native or here on the West Coast where it was an introduced species. Next slide. Salmonids are also a new species for the West Coast harbor porpoises. They're a little bit different because in the Atlantic, they have been identified as part of the porpoise diet. So in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, in Scandinavia, in West Greenland, and in the Baltic Sea, uh, salmon have, have all been noted as part of the harbor porpoise diet in the Atlantic. However, this is the first documentation that we found of porpoises on the West Coast catching large salmon. Next slide. So what would be the benefits of this type of behavior? Well, first off, harbor porpoises really do live life in the fast lane. They have an extremely high metabolic rate. They start reproducing fairly early in life between about three and four years old. Um, and if they're already nutritionally stressed, harbor porpoises can actually starve to death in as little as three days. So it's extremely important that they have reliable food sources and are foraging very, very consistently. So logically, if you can consume a very large meal, you get a very large energetic payout from that. So one of the main things that would be a benefit here is just that that would be a large fish meal for you. You wouldn't have to forage for the next several hours on small forage fish. This is where we also revisit it being important to note the sex of the animal performing this behavior. So for pregnant or lactating female harbor porpoises, they have to consume up to about 200% more calories than a similarly sized male because of their higher energetic needs. Very similar to a female human, you know, you require more food when you're pregnant or feeding your baby. So this type of behavior, big fish and big energy intake, this might be more important for females because they have this higher energetic need. And because they are spending the majority of their life reproductively active and many are pregnant and lactating at the same time for a lot of their life, they have kind of a sustained high need for energy. Next slide. Of course, there are going to be inherent risks in consuming large prey. So asphyxiation of harbor porpoises has been documented in several locations with several different fish species, um, basically the harbor porpoise choking on a large fish item. A couple of those are from the West Coast. So we have some instances on the outer coast of Washington of porpoises asphyxiating on those American shad. And in San Francisco, they also had one instance of a porpoise consuming a, gray smooth, a smooth greyhound shark um, and choking on it. So it seems that risk increases with increasing size of fish, fairly logical, and then also with species that have those dorsal spines. So like I mentioned earlier, the American shad have dorsal spines. Harbor porpoises typically consume their prey head first. And if you're consuming a large fish, realize partway down that it's too big and you have to spit it back out and it has dorsal spines, it's more likely that those could get caught in the gullet and make it harder for the porpoise to actually regurgitate the prey and it could choke. Next slide. So in conclusion, harbor porpoises are seeming to consume larger prey items or at least catching them regularly on the west coast of the U.S. American shad and salmon species should be listed as prey items for U.S. west coast harbor porpoises. And again, a little plug here for harbor porpoise research, but it is really, really important to understand the type and size of prey that porpoises are consuming, not just to understand the foraging ecology and the behavior of the porpoises, but also to understand how they fit into our Salish Sea food web and how they're impacting their prey species as well, especially if they're consuming prey that we weren't realizing that they were actually eating. And finally, that this behavior may be more frequently seen in pregnant or lactating female harbor porpoises due to those higher energetic needs. They could feel more pressure to do those risky behaviors and get the bigger payout. Next slide. So just a little bit of uh, future work here. We are working on a paper currently to document those asphyxiation cases that I mentioned along the West Coast. So we have instances from California, Oregon, and Washington in that paper. Quick spoiler alert, um, almost all of the fish in those cases of asphyxiated harbor porpoises were those American shad that have the dorsal spines. And almost all of the porpoises in those instances were female and most were reproductively active. So it does seem as though there may be a sex bias towards this behavior. Next slide. But of course, more research is always needed. Um, porpoise behavior in general is very poorly understood in the wild. Most of our reports come from dead animals or animals in captivity. So this type of observational report is really, really important to understand not only their behavior, but also their relationship to their ecosystem and to their prey.
And I think the next one is the last slide. Yep, so thank you very much to my co-authors, to our supporters and our volunteers, and to our funders, Orange, Community, Orange County Community Foundation and the Endeavor Community Foundation. And thank you all for coming to this conference and for listening today. And thank you, Scott, for moving my slides. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thanks so much, Kat, to you and Cindy and your co-authors. Co um, the next presenter is uh, Megan Federn, coming to you from the University of Washington. Um, and she, I think, is going to try sharing her screen as well. Looks good, Megan. All right. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you all about a bit of my dissertation work that I'm doing at the University of Washington um, with Gordon Holtgreave from UW and Eric Ward of the Northwest Fishery Science Center. Um, and it's titled Reconstructing a Century of Predator Trophic Position in Washington with our Archival Harbor Seal Bone. So here in the Salish Sea, um, it comes as no surprise given the previous presentations that we've had today, um, we have a number of competing interests, um, specifically regarding predator recoveries. Um, so we have harbor seals in the region that have seen tenfold population increases since the 1970s. And at the same time, they're still protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So we have these recovering predator populations that increase competition with humans for common resources. So for example, that might be things like salmon or herring, um, anything that's commercially fished. Um, we also have new trade-offs that emerge when we have these protected predators that are also consuming protected prey. For example, Chinook salmon are listed here under the ESA. Multiple predator populations are also competing for common limited prey resources. So the question we're really trying to tease apart with this research is how are harbor seals interacting with the food web? And we're really interested in understanding how harbor seal trophic position may vary both through space and time and how bottom up effects may influence harbor seal, seal trophic ecology. So a little bit more specifically, um, we're interested in understanding how food web conditions impact harbor seal trophic position. So how, for example, low trophic level species abundance may influence their foraging ecology. Same thing with high level species abundance. And we're also interested in understanding a little bit more about interspecific interactions um, that have occurred as this popu these populations have recovered. So just a few examples. So when I refer to things like low trophic level species, it's things like forage fish or herring, um, but also things like juvenile fish, such as juvenile salmonids. Um, higher trophic level species are more things like adult salmon, hake, um, tom cod, those kind of things. But we're also interested in understanding a, li bit, a little bit more about the bottom-up processes that are affecting the system. Um, specifically how coastal productivity would indirectly impact harbor seal trophic position. So things like primary productivity in the region have the potential to influence a number of different prey species at once. Um, same things with things like nitrogen availability that overall um, can affect the productivity in the region. Um, and these might be better indicators of overall harbor seal trophic position um, and changes in their overall foraging ecology than individual abundances of individual species, just because harbor seals are such generalist predators um, that many different prey species are not um, a large percentage of their overall diet. So the approach we're taking to do this research is compound specific stable isotope analysis of amino acids. And I'll just give you all a, a quick primer on that because it um, is a little important to understand for some of our uh, analyses. So with classic trophic position calculations that you do from isotope data, you're essentially measuring a weighted average of all of the amino acids that are contained in the um, tissue of the consumer that you are measuring. Um, and those are weighted based on the overall abundance of each of those individual amino acids. So when we're trying to calculate something over long time scales, like we are in this particular project, it becomes really important that you're able to control for any variation of um, phytoplankton isotope values 
through time. Um, specifically here on the Salish Sea, that's particularly important because we've seen a lot of increases in things like wastewater treatment and agricultural runoff over the last hundred years. And that has the potential to influence the isotope composition at the base of the food web. Um, however, the likelihood of getting, you know, a museum specimen and also a phytoplankton tow from the same time period is essentially no, not going to happen. So instead, we use two different groups of amino acids to calculate our overall trophic position. Um, first, we use source amino acids, and source amino acids actually don't show any change in their isotopic com composition as they are transferred through the food web with each trophic level. So they're essentially reflective of that phytoplankton signature. And we're able to combine those with trophic amino acids that behave a bit more like classic bulk analyses um, that do in fact show enrichment with each trophic transfer. And we can combine the two to get an overall trophic position estimate that, that controls for some of those baseline changes. So the analysis, the samples that we're using come from a number of different museum institutions that are curated both here in the U.S. and Canada. Um, we have sampled 145 individuals. So this is a pretty large data set for um, compound specific analyses, particularly of uh, marine mammals. Um, there hasn't been a data set for um, mammals that is quite this large um, before. So we've divided them into two main regional locations. Um, we have Salish Sea samples here in that yellow brown color and then on the outer coast we also have coastal samples as well. Our earliest samples come from 1928 and our most recent samples come from 2014, though our coastal specimens have a little bit shorter of a time series. And we're getting three main data sets from these data. First, we're getting our trophic position calculation. Um, then we're also getting our source isotope data, which can be reflective of um, changes in those nitrogen sources in the system, as I mentioned. So things like anthropogenic runoff is one example. Um, and we also are able to get our carbon isotope data as well. Um, carbon isotopes can be a good indicator of things like um, phytoplankton growth and um, also changes in community composition. And again, carbon don't tend to, carbon isotopes don't tend to enrich much of the food web. So we're able to get both of these data sets from the um, consumers because they don't show much of that enrichment. So just a, a brief um, intro to what some of that we're finding in some of the data. First off, we aren't really finding many any differences between um, trophic position and sex. Um, we only are able to use a subset of the data um, to do this analysis, um, just because some of the museum specimens are limited in their metadata. And similar, similarly, we don't find any difference um, in trophic position with overall size. So this is just using a standard length because that is what is available primarily in the metadata. And um, just one caveat is we do have some small individuals, but generally speaking, we try to target only adult harbor seals um, for our sampling. Um, so to answer those original questions that I introduced at the beginning of this presentation, we're really fitting two main models to these data sets. Um, we're fitting um, our, our food web model candidate set that uses a bunch of different biomass estimates from prey that we either know make up a relatively large portion of harbor seal diet, such as hake or even herring. Um, and then we're also using a number of ones that we're interested in more from a management standpoint. So for example, um, different um, salmon escapement counts or small productions from both hatchery and wild production estimates. And then we also have our harbor seal population estimates to get at that kind of interest specific component. Um, and then finally, we also have our productivity data to kind of look at the, um, the bottom up effects that are really affecting where these harbor seals are foraging. Um, so the next few slides are going to look a bit like this. Um, so the, this is essentially our best model that we have from those candidate model sets that I just introduced to you. Um, here on the right, you'll see the covariates that had the most support for inclusion in those models. Um, and then you can also see these estimates are our fixed effects. So they're essentially the overall estimate for each of those covariate relationships. And we used a combination of different amino acids to, to um, calculate those. So overall, we have um, support for inclusion of a um, negative correlation between harbor seal abundance and trophic position, indicating that harbor seals are actually feeding lower in the food web when they are more abundant. Um, 
Similarly, we see a negative correlation with herring abundance and harbor seal trophic position. This makes um, sense. Har herring tend to be a relatively low trophic level species for them to be feeding on. So we would anticipate that if they're really utilizing that prey source um, when it's available that we would have this negative relationship. Um, and overall, our coastal harbor seal trophic positions are estimated right around 4.5. But one of my most, one of the things that I find most interesting about this is that we find a very substantial difference in the Salish Sea harbor seal trophic position relative to those coastal, um, those coastal seals, where they're all, can, eating at almost a half a trophic level lower in the food web, which is pretty substantial. Um, so similarly, we get a lot of support for some of these bottom-up effects. So here on our right, we see um, our isotope value. Um, and then here on the bottom, we for our carbon, which is, which is essentially an indicator of productivity, um, where we see a positive relationship with that. And then here at the bottom, we also see a change based on our nitrogen data set, where harbor seals seem to be feeding lower in the food web with that higher nitrogen signal. Um, we're still teasing apart um, how this is, might be all related, but um, from a bird's eye view, it seems that there is a relationship where they are feeding lower in the food web with more anthropogenic nitrogen. And again, we have this really big um, support again for this location effect. So we also fit some climate, uh, some environmental models as well. Um, and we get a really big support for climate regime as well in our models where, um, so this is things like uh, indice of things like PDO and El Nino, where in above average years, we find that harbor seals are eating lower in the food web. So just kind of our overall results, um, harbor seal trophic ecology seems to be really linked to intraspecific competition, primary productivity, and an potentially anthropogenic nitrogen, um, where these bottom-up effects seem to be leveraging abundance on a large scale rather than um, ind individual species abundances, which is not surprising, but um, important nonetheless. Um, so just kind of answering our overall initial question, um, harbor seal trophic ecology seems to be really linked to intraspecific competition, um, primary productivity, and nitrogen availability in the, in the system. Also, harbor seal trophic ecology does not seem to be static and actually is responding to a lot of these physical drivers in the system and bottom-up forces. And this is important if we're trying to estimate their overall consumption of some species in the region. Um, and again, that spatial variability component seems to be um, really important and will likely uh, affect our overall estimates of how of what harbor seals are foraging on. And with that, I would just like to acknowledge all of our museum collaborators that have curated all of the um, specimens that we were able to use for this project. So that includes the Burke Museum here in Washington and the Slater Museum here in Washington, the National Marine Mammal Laboratory, the Royal BC Museum and the Smithsonian Institute and Sea Grant are funders. Fantastic, thank you very much, Megan. We um, are doing pretty well on time. Thanks for catching us up a little bit. Um, there's, we've got at least one question and uh, John, if you're still on, there's one lingering question from your talk as well. The uh, next next speaker is Steve Jeffries from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, everybody can hear me? Yes? Yes, yeah. I, yeah. sounds good. Okay, thanks, thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, thanks for, thanks to you, Scott, for pulling this thing together. I know we, uh, um, we're all kind of antsy to get back and do field work and, uh, Get out and do this. Is the this picture is the South Sound uh, last uh, March? So uh, uh, it's nice to be on the water. We're kind of uh, stuck at home, but um, anyway, my talk is about uh, California sea lions, harbor seals, and long beach common dolphins foraging on, on anchovies in South Puget Sound. And uh, my co-authors are uh, Phil Dion, who works in the forage fish program for. Fish and Wildlife, and, and Nick Wenzel, who's a, a biologist for Seattle shellfish, is in, and is on the water uh, most days uh, working in their shellfish beds in South Sound. So he's a, he's my eyes on the water. Next slide. 
Yeah, so the, the, the three players that picked that first picture had uh, 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 Long Beach Common Dolphin on the top and, and California Sea Lions, and these are harbor seals. And I'm going to talk about this uh, collaborative feeding that's been going on in the South Sound. But I want to start, next slide. Next slide, Scott. I want to talk a little bit about what's going on with California sea lions and, and uh, uh, their movement into, in, into Puget Sound, in and out of Puget Sound. So uh, this is sort of biology of uh, California sea lions. They breed in the Channel Islands and in, in Mexico, Mexican waters. Next slide. They, they primarily on the, their, their rookeries are in the Channel Islands. This is actually Point Bennett. Uh, this is California sea lion rookery midsummer. Um, it's on the west end of uh, San Miguel Island. It's the largest uh, California sea lion rookery in the United States. There's about 25,000 pups that are born uh, on San Miguel each year. Um, next slide. One of the things that uh, is done at San Miguel is National Marine Fishery Service has had a long-term, uh, it's a 50-year uh, study, long-term study going on in San Miguel and they they're able to determine uh, the de demography and survival of uh, California sea lions. And they, the, the, the yellow ovals are, show branded animals. So some people ask about where are all these branded animals coming from that you see on, in, in the Salish Sea. And some of them are branded uh, as pups on the Channel Islands uh, by the National Marine Fishery Service. And uh, they follow, be, they're able to follow these animals over time and get their survival based on these long-term marks, which is the brands. Next, next, go ahead and just click it one more time. So this is this box, this red box shows, um, there's actually three females with pups and there's actually three, three little puppies that are just sitting there by themselves. And one of the things that happens on these rookeries is these females nurse their pups for three or four days and then they go out to sea and feed so the three pups that are by themselves there on that, in that red box are just waiting for their mom, moms to come back and then, they, then they reunite and nurse for three or four days. So the, the females are gone for three to four days, come back, nurse for three or four days. And that cycle goes on for about six months. So, uh, and the females with, with their pups really don't leave California waters and uh, juvenile uh, sea lions and, and females really don't go much farther north when they migrate from the rookeries than the, than the, the California Oregon border. Go ahead, next slide. One of the things that, that the Marine Mammal Lab has been able to do with this long time, time, time series is to, to look at uh, you know, the trends in abundance. So we know that the California sea lion population has increased from about 75,000 in, in the just after the Marine Mammal Protection Act was passed in 1972, to almost 275,000 uh, animals today. And they're within what's called the optimal sustainable population level under the MMPA, which is OSP. Um, next slide. That's not my, that's next slide. Good, next slide. Um, so, so one of the things that, uh, this is actually um, a, a figure that shows um, a track line from, a, from one of 30 male California sea lions that we tagged at, at Bremerton, Manchester in Puget Sound for a project for the Navy. So some of these, this information is uh, from this work that we did from the Navy. But this actually shows an animal that was tagged in late January in Puget Sound. It spent February, March, April, and most of May in Puget Sound foraging. And then in June and July, it actually migrated down the coast to, to Santa Barbara, was recited on the, on the rookery in Santa Barbara, and actually migrated back up north. And actually, the tag was recovered at Cape Olava on the outer Washington coast. So there, there, uh, there's an annual migration of males back and forth from their, from their rookery. They disperse, there's about 60 to 80,000 Males are they're sub adult and adult animals. They basically average three to five to three to 12 years in age, and they disperse from their breeding rookeries in midsummer and go all the way up into southeast Alaska and also out into the into Aleutia. So they, they disperse into Cal into Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, and Alaska. Next slide. Um, 
This is on the northward migration. They, they stop off at different areas. This is actually in the Columbia River. This, this picture was taken on the 20th of March this year. Uh, there's smelt in the Columbia River at this, this time. This is, these are the Rainier, these are the Foss uh, tug docks that are just across from the mouth of the Cowlitz River. There's uh, smelt in the river right now. There's some at, at when this picture was taken. There's probably 400 to 600 sea lions that are feeding on Yulikon smelt in the Columbia River. Next slide. Um, they, they continue north uh, and they move into Puget Sound and they occupy um, their primary haulage sites in Puget Sound are these port security barriers that are around the Navy facilities at Everett, Manger, and Bremerton. This is Bremerton and you can see the sea lions on those black pontoon buoys, on these port security buoys, these barriers. Next slide. These are uh, California sea lions. These are sl slides on uh, <laughs> subs over at, at Bangor. This is sub base, uh, and that all that whitewash is uh, seal uh, sea lion cats on the on the on a on a sub over at Bangor. Go ahead, next slide. They they they. Uh, they haul out on those subs because they've got a and and the and the uh, port security buoys because they're because they're black and they they, they uh, have a little bit of a heat signature so they're they're warm. <clears throat> they come into Puget Sound. There's other places that they're used. These are these are Foss barges that are uh, in the corner of Commencement Bay. Uh, this is in 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 the fall. They move come into Puget Sound. Go ahead, next slide. And they're they're coming in, and these are we actually go out and collect scats. So these are these are these are the the diet from California sea lions, uh, 60 scats that we collected in 2017 uh, in Commencement Bay. And um, you can see we uh, talked about um, arbor porpoise eating American shad. Cal California sea lions are actually eating shad as well. It's about 15% of the diet of those 60, 60 scats. But northern anchovy, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, it makes up about 30% of their diet in Commencement Bay. So it's a driver. And you can also see in the in the, their diet, they eat uh, salmon species. There's Chinook, Chum, Coho, Steelhead, um, pink salmon. So they, they're eating five of the salmon species in Puget Sound. And there's actually a mallard duck in that food habits that they eat. Next slide. Um, they are in Puget Sound. This is again a, 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 an aerial shot. We fly surveys, uh, aerial surveys. This was actually shot in, on March 20th this year. So this is an aggregation of California sea lions. If everybody can guess how many sea lions are in that picture. We estimate the number of animals and then uh, we take a picture and we count them. Go ahead, next slide. There's 151 animals that we counted in that slide. I don't know what everybody else estimated, but uh, next slide. And this, this shows, uh, we also are counting them. The work that we did for the Navy, we ended up counting them at uh, all the, the Navy facilities. And you can see um, in the summertime, June, July, when they're in the breeding rookeries, the numbers are low. You get an increase as they migrate, start moving into the sound in August. There's a peak in the fall, October, November. They're targeting chum salmon at that point in time. Uh, there's a decrease in some of these animals are leaving in December, January. And then there's, go ahead, next next slide. It's the heads up, you got about four. Okay, next slide. Go ahead, next slide. So we, we go ahead and we've caught them. Uh, go ahead, next slide. We put tags on them. This is how we track them. Go ahead, next slide. So we do an estimated number of sea lions, California sea lions in Puget Sound. It's, uh, you know, it's about 800 animals range, it's about 500 to 1200. Next slide. Uh, we know from those tags that they forage in that red area, that area in central Puget Sound. Uh, you can't see it in this slide very well, but there's actually a little yellow area of foraging in Case Inlet. Go ahead, next slide. Go next slide. We actually They've got dive data from those animals. So some of them are diving shallow, but some of them are diving to, you know, over a hundred meters, that's in meters. So those, those animals, and if you look where they're, if you look at the bathymetry of Puget Sound, that area that they're foraging in, 
is actually the only area in Puget Sound that can act, actually dive that deep. That's where the deepest part is. Go ahead, next slide. And this is what, what's been going on for the last five years. There's, there's been about 300 to 500 California sea lions in Puget Sound, South Puget Sound. This is Case Inlet. This is last year. Go ahead, next slide. And there, the area is, um, so it's Case Inlet. It's one of the two bigger inlets in South Sound. Go ahead, next slide. <clears throat> just focusing in. Go ahead and next slide. And this is a bathymetry for that area that they were they were foraging. These animals were it basically had these anchovies encircled in the deepest part of uh, Case Inlet, and they were basically. Go ahead, next slide. They were doing this active feeding where they were the porpoises. They were they were, they were working together this. We would see the porpoises circling and then the sea lions would surf. Go ahead, next slide. Go ahead, next slide. Go ahead, next slide. And it's just this big frenzy. Go ahead, can you go, 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 go back one, Scott? Go back one. Go back one. Yeah, so they did this active foraging and they'd all come up and they'd all, and, uh, breathe and then go back down and they do this two or three times. Go ahead, next slide. And then they come up, to, these guys are actually recovering. They're all just resting. If you see them, they're panting on the surface. The, 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 the dolphins are, are slow swimming and they're all basically recovering. And, and they, they did this for three or four minutes and then they started fast swimming. Go ahead, next slide. And synchronous diving. They would go down that, that those ripples on the water there was where the group of animals were. Go ahead, next slide. What's on the bottom is uh, a layer of anchovies. We don't know how exactly they are. We jig for these fish. Uh, go ahead, next slide. Go ahead, next slide. Uh, we do know that there's a massive biomass. This is a this is a die off on Case Inlet in 2015. Go ahead, next slide. Go ahead, next slide. And this beach was just littered with dead anchovies. So there's this big anchovy biomass that's in the south sound. Go ahead, next slide. But we don't really know much about it. We've been we've been going out there and, and, and watching this phenomenon for the last uh, three years. They were there again this year. Um, anyway, they. Uh, but we need to do for initiate research and, and continue research because we're all just doing this as sort of an, an anecdotal, not anecdotal. We're going out there opportunistically to record this stuff. But we aren't recording. We need to record seasonal abundance. We don't have any idea of uh, how much anchovy is actually being being eaten in the cons consumption estimates for California sea lion Puget Sound. We don't know what the biomass is in case in the South Sound. It attracts dolphins, it attack, attracts sea lions, it attacks two years ago, it attract, attracted humpback whales as well. Uh, and, we, and then we need to see if there's a correlation between these forage fish spawning events and, and, the, and uh, Sea line distribution. Go ahead, next slide. And this next slide is uh, this is we're we're actually collecting, we're trying to collect scats. So there's we're, just, we're these certain guys are we're queuing in on the dolphins. They surface and we're going. And there's going to be dolphins bow riding. So uh, they were working together. These are Long Beach common dolphins, and then we're trying to get into this group of sea lions so we can scoop up poop samples. So we're gonna we're kind of gonna move over here and uh, move into the this group of sea lions that just surfaced. You get you know, probably three or four chances to scoop up poop before they go back down again, and and, and the poop cloud basically dissipates pretty quickly. But um, and that's that's the end of my uh, presentation there. So um, wait, thank you. Great, thank you, Steve, for the tour of South Sound. Um, our last speaker is Eileen Ettinger and talking about Southern resident killer whales. Thanks so much, Scott, and thank you all for being here. Thanks for sticking around till the last talk. Um, I am the quantitative ecologist at the Nature Conservancy, and I'm excited to share with you some of the, our research on shifting phenology of Southern resident killer whales. Um, next slide, Scott. 
my, I have many collaborators and co-authors um, shown here, Jamil, Sam Horry, Chris Harvey, Candy Emmons, Brad Hansen, and Eric Ward, all at NOAA, and Jennifer Olson, who was at the Whale Museum, are my co-authors. Next slide. So Southern resident killer whales, um, for those of you not from the Salish Sea region and may not be as familiar with them as those of us living here are, um, Killer whales are widespread, of course, but they exist in different populations and these southern resident killer whales are distinct um, in part because they are fish eating um, and southern residents in particular are listed as an endangered population. Um, they are distinct, they're grouped into three distinct pods um, that follow a matrilineal grouping and these are termed J, K, and L pod. Um, they were listed endangered here in the U.S. in 2005, um, a bit earlier in Canada, and they're threatened um, by a number of things, including um, it thought a lack of food, vessel noise from boats, pollution in the waters of the Salish Sea, and also just their small population size. Next slide. Um, so it seems, I uh, can forward two clicks. Um, uh, if you're in the Salish Sea region, you've probably been made aware of recent public reports in the newspaper, um, as well as scientific reports suggesting that these whales may be shifting their activity in the sea. So last year, for instance, um, there were many articles saying, where are these whales? They typically come into the Salish Sea um, in the summer. There's part of the region that's termed as their summer core habitat. And last summer, they were barely seen there at all. And so this was cause for alarm of some, of many in the region. Next slide, please. Um, and we wondered, are these kind of recent observations part of any long-term shifts in their phenology in the timing of their activity? Next. Um, and many marine organisms around the world um, have sh been shifting their phenology. A shift in the timing of activity is probably the most widely observed biological impact of climate change. This slide here is from a meta-analysis that was done of um, marine organisms, and it's just showing the magnitude of change in the timing of different events across a wide range of organisms from benthic algae up to seabirds. Um, in this particular slide, negative numbers mean earlier, and so that's towards the upper end of the graph. Next slide. And here, specifically on the west coast, we've seen a lot of shifts in the timing of salmon phenology. So this particular figure is from a paper by Kovac et al. that was done in southeast Alaska, um, documenting timing in the shifts in timing of migration by adult salmon. Um, each, each color is a different species of salmon, including Chinook, Coho, Pink, Sockeye, and um, each bar is a different population. And in this case, actually, the, the, the y-axis is flipped. So upper bars mean later, um, lower bars mean they've shifted their timing earlier. Still negative numbers mean earlier. Um, but so salmon do seem to be shifting their phenology here. One of the things I want you to take away from this slide as well as the previous slide is though there are a lot of shifts happening, they do vary quite a bit, both in the direction. So in this case, some salmon are shifting their migration later and some others are shifting earlier, but also in the magnitude. So some bars are smaller than, and others are larger. Next slide. Um, and so these sh shifts in phenology have um, been concerning to many people and it's brought up this question, especially these variable shifts suggest they set up a situation where interacting species may under climate change scenarios, if they're responding differently, if their phenologies are shifting at different rates, it sets up a situation where you may have what's been termed a phenological mismatch, where if there are asynchronous shifts between um, an organism and it, an interacting organism, so a, a southern resident killer whales and their prey, for example, it could um, lead to a mismatch that would reduce their prey availability, further stressing this, stressing this already um, endangered population. So here I'm showing just a schematic of um, a population of, of a, the black bar is, is showing southern resident killer whales and the pink bar is showing prey, showing what it would look like if their phenologies were lined up. So you'd have peak occurrence probability of southern resident killer whales timed with peak prey abundance. Next slide. 
and then if this were the case, you'd expect the phenologies of these two organisms to be strongly correlated so that a later prey arrival year would lead to a, a later southern resident killer whale, whale year. Next slide. Next slide. You can go ahead and click again as well. Um, however, if there were asynchronous shifts leading to a phenological mismatch, you might see, um, for example, salmon shifting um, later. Um, that southern resident killer whales may not be responding to that shift, perhaps because they're migrating from just farther away areas and they may not be aware of these shifts in the timing of salmon. Um, and that would lead to a, a poor, poor, poor correlation between these two um, phenologies. It's also important to note that the phenologies might not be strongly correlated also if southern resident killer whales are responding instead to a different prey source than the one we happen to be tracking. Next slide. Um, and the, the, I just wanted to call attention that the, the, these graphs suggest, um, that I've been showing suggest that um, the phenologies are shifting altogether, but there's, uh, you could think of them as a, a first, the first arrival date would be sort of the beginning of the curve, the peak would be the top, and the last arrival date would be the end of the curve as shown. Next slide. Um, so we wanted to address these specific study questions. Has the timing of southern resident killer whale activity shifted in the Salish Sea? Um, and do these shifts, if they do occur, coincide with shifts in the phenology of salmon? Next slide. Next slide. So to do this, we took advantage of um, a great uh, database that probably is the, is the longest occurring um, time series of southern resident killer whale activity in the region. It's the Orca Master Database. It's an opportunistic database data set um, that's a mix of um, sort of scientifically collected standardized data as well as um, public sightings reported in um, through a website. Um, next slide. And because much of the data are opportunistic, um, there's a lot of ways that it can be affected by sort of changes in effort over time. So we took kind of, we had two approaches with using this data state. The first was to explore um, these questions for one location with really consistent data collection for both southern resident killer whales and salmon. And then we wanted to look broader, take a broader look across the region um, using more of the a data set, um, acknowledging that there may be some biases in shifts in effort over the course of the data set. Next slide. So starting with the one location with consistent data, that's Lion Kiln Point State Park in the San Juan Islands. Um, you can see on this map where it's located um, in the Salish Sea. And then I also wanna point out on this map the Albion test fishery data, which is what we use for um, our, our Chinook salmon um, data. And Chinook salmon are the primary prey. I mentioned salmon, but Chinook salmon are the primary prey of, of Southern resident killer whales. Um, and particularly when they're in their summer core habitat, which is in the area around Lime Kiln State Park near San Juan Island, um, the diet study suggests that the, the bulk of their diet during this time of, during the summer around this region is um, Chinook salmon from the Fraser River, which is where the Albion test fishery is located. And this test fishery has been col uh, collecting data um, for, since the 1980s. Next slide. So we use these two data sets um, um, for some models that I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about, though I'm happy to answer questions about it's just for lack of time, um, to get estimates of the occurrence probability of southern resident killer whales um, throughout the summer season, as well as the Chinook abundance um, and the, the phenology of that um, throughout the overlapping time series. Next slide. And so what we find, I'm going to show you the Chinook abundance curves first. You can click forward, Scott, thanks, um, at Lime Kiln. Next slide. It's so uh, the y-axis is showing um, their abundance, and the x-axis is the day of the year, so starting in about April. Um, and I'm showing two here, two lines here, just because it makes it easier than showing an, all the different annual lines, but I've divided the data set into the first um, early part of the time series from 1994 to 2005, and then the later part of the time series from 2006 to 2017. And you can see um, that the Albion test fishery data suggests that there's been um, 
from the dash line, which is the early time series, to the later line, the salmon, the early part of their arrival has dropped dramatically um, due to a collapse of several of the runs that are occur in the spring typically. Um, and so this is leading to a shift in the peak timing so that it occurs later. You can see that the, the the first, the peak time used to occur quite early in the season. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> um, and that peak has disappeared by and large and the peak now occurs much later. Um, next slide. And now I'm overlaying the Southern Resident Killer Whale observations only from Lime Kiln Point State Park. And we focus on Lime Kiln again because it's really consistent data collection from May through August. And we know that someone was there every day looking for the whales. You can see again, the early part of the time series is in the dashed line. Um, they used to be, have a much higher abundance uh, probability of occurrence early in the season. Um, and in the later half of the time series, which is the solid line, it's, it's dropped so that the peak occurrence probability is now occurring much later, um, close to day 200, where it used to occur, occur closer to day 160 or 180. Next slide. And so, and then if you look at the correlation between just the peak occurrence probability day of year um, across the time series for Southern Resident Killer Whales on the y-axis versus the peak abundance day of year, for salmon, um, you can, they are correlated. Um, in this figure, the darker colors are earlier um, and it get, the colors get lighter with um, more closer to current day of year. Next slide. And we also see, um, so we also see that the, the day of year is earlier in years when um, Chinook abundance is higher. So there's this inverse relationship between occurrence probability and abundance of Chinook at Lime Kiln. Next, next slide. And so then we just wanted to broaden a bit to look, use more of the data set. Um, next slide. And look across, if these same patterns hold true for this whole region, the blue, all the blue points show observations of whales from the Orca Master data set in um, the central or, or upper Salish Sea region. We also looked at um, the Puget Sound region, which is in yellow observations down there, but I'm not gonna talk about those today because I don't have time. Next slide. Um, and if we look across the broader region, um, we see a similar pattern. Um, so it's not just at Lime Kiln where uh, to do this, we looked at each pod individually. So I'm showing the probability of J pod, um, the other whale, pods so similar patterns but they do differ somewhat. Again we see um, that they used to occur, the occurrence probability used to be high early in the season um, and it's dropped um, now so that the peak is occurring later close to around day of year 200 for the region. Next slide. And this is the trend over time if we just look at the day of year with the peak um, occurrence probability. So it varies, it's variable across the time series but it's a strong trend of, of getting later. To arriving to the region later. Next slide. Yeah, there are just a couple minutes left. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and this is just to summarize, um, each of these dots is showing the, the trend, the slope of that line that I showed you, but it's a way to summarize across all three pods in the first panel. So you can see that they vary um, between the pods, J pod showing the strongest delay across the time series, but that the peak and first arrival dates are, are um, delaying for K and J pod. Um, LPOD is, does not show a strong trend. And then I'm also showing next to that the trends in the Fraser River Chinook salmon first peak and last um, dates. Next slide. And I just wanted to remind myself to remind you that um, this, the, the shifts in the Chinook timing is not, it's not that each population of salmon is delaying their arrival, but it's rather this change in the peak abundance across all different populations in the Fraser River that seems that is um, delaying. Next slide. Um, I also wanted to put in a caveat that, of course, um, southern resident killer whale activity is affected by many other things, not only the Chinook salmon is likely to affect their activity in the region. There have been many ecosystem changes, some of which you've heard about today, increases in um, top predators and increases in other mammals in the region. There have been um, behavioral and social changes in the pod and certainly changes in vessel traffic and noise. Next slide. And so just to summarize, you can click through all of these, Scott, if you don't mind. Um, we've 
found that southern rat resident killer whale activity has shifted later at Lime Kiln State Park and across the broader Central Salish Sea region. And these shifts seem to be consistent with shifts in their primary prey, the Fraser River Chinook salmon. Um, but the shifts do vary somewhat across the three pods. Um, so this suggests that southern resident killer whales are able to track shifts in their prey. So we're not seeing evidence of a phenological mismatch. Um, but we do think it's an, this is something that these shifts in phenology haven't fully been incorporated into proposed management um, to help southern resident killer whales. They're not fully incorporated into monitoring of salmon and um, whales together. And so we, we um, encourage an incorporation of phenology um, and as well as not just in southern resident killer whales, but it was, as we think about other shifts throughout the region and shifts in the timing of, of energy flow and ecosystem changes. Um, as a response to climate change. It's likely to see more of these shifts in the future. Thank you so much for listening. Wonderful. Thank you, Eileen. And thank you to all of the speakers. I just wanted to, again, emphasize that uh, these are troubled times and we all would rather be out doing field research, but I uh, really appreciate everyone hustling the last couple of weeks to make this happen. and. Thank you all participants for um, chiming in and with your questions and learning a little bit with us today and tomorrow about the Salish Sea. Uh, I wanna end by just reminding you that uh, there's a session tomorrow morning on Southern Resident Killer Whales and ongoing sessions regarding many other things. So don't forget to visit the schedule and take a look at all the offerings in this first virtual conference. Um, thanks also to Caleb for uh, supporting us throughout this. You trained us up well, and I'm really glad things went smoothly today. All right. So we'll keep the Q&A open for a few minutes um, so that panelists, especially Eileen, can respond to some of your good questions. Um, but do feel free to sign off if you need to. And thank you again for all your research and, and thinking about the Salish Sea.